When I was young, my mother and I used to do a lot of crafts together. She taught me how to sew, how to paint, just how to be creative. And I found uh, a real peace in that. And uh, my grandfather also used to sketch a lot. And when I'd visit them, I would sit at the kitchen table and draw the whole time I visited my grandparents. So oh, I did have influences in, in my family that encouraged my art. When I was little, I was always drawn to be creative and use my imagination. I remember specifically in grade two, sitting at my desk in my, in the cl my classroom with my teacher, Mr. Greer, who was a super creative teacher, and seeing his five-year-old or four-year-old daughter, I believe, um, painting at the easel that was set up in our classroom, and I had this longing that that is where I need to be. That is what I want to do. And, it, and it, I, I've carried that with me. I had such a feeling like that, that should be me painting over there. Um, also in that classroom, he took one of the drawings I had done and hung them on the classroom wall. So from a young age, I knew that this was something that I stood out for. I academically, I, I didn't excel, but in art, I always did. And uh, everyone around me sort of pushed that influence on me and reinforced it because either because I was really good, I'm not sure, or because I lacked in other things naturally. So to boost my confidence, the they people sort of put more emphasis on the arts. Regardless, it, it fostered the belief that I was, um, I had a special talent. My formal training in art um, extended after high school. At, I went to University of McMaster in Hamilton to study visual arts. But um, believing that I could be an artist as a full-time career started when I, I switched high schools and um, we were living in Oshawa and we moved back to Kingston where our family is originally from. And the art teacher there, um, Berkeley Breen, he, he and I had a special connection. He, he saw something in me or maybe he was just one of those great teachers that saw something in everyone and made you believe that. But he, he and I both shared a love of sports and art and I think that combination isn't always prevalent, um, but it was between he and I. He was the football coach and rugby coach, and he played fo football for Queens growing up. And I played all the sports in high school, and so did my sisters. So sports was a big part of our lives. So this there was this similarity between us, but he really fostered my art, um, the belief I had, and encouraged me to put a portfolio together. And, apply to university for art. So I did, I went to McMaster and spent four years um, in the program there. It was a really great program because uh, it was small to begin with. It, first year was 60 and by the end of fourth year, there was only 14 of us left. And that gave a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with the professors and sort of uh, mirroring them as artists they, they had their own practices um, as well as um, teaching. And what I sort of took from um, Mr. Breen and my profs at university was the longing they had to create their, their art, but they didn't have enough time to, whether they could take a sabbatical every four years to study their art. And I thought I owed it to them after I finished university to, to give art a try right off the bat, because this is what I heard from so many people, so many creatives, is that they would, you know, have this other job that could, that sort of went hand on hand with their passion for art, that paid the bills, but I had this feeling if they had done it all over again, they would have just tried to do the art first. So that, their influences and mentorship came in that way from, I needed to try it right off the bat before I had anything to lose. So I went, 
right out of university and, and started using being creative and developing a business. Um, right away, I've actually made hats for two years before I started painting full time. Just, I needed a break from academic art is very different than commercial art. And uh, tromping along, uh, tr tromping out in my army boots and a tutu standing on my head wasn't going to make me any money like I had been uh, sort of indulging in my fourth year at university. So I took some time, but uh, those are, that's, that's my formal training. And uh, those are my mentors. So a, a group of teachers who, who influenced the steps I took into my future career. I've had many studios over the years. I've been a professional artist, I'd say, so creating to sell for 25 years. And my husband and I bought the old Maple Grove Schoolhouse in 1995. And that's the year that I started painting, um, put down my sewing machine or put that aside and picked up my paintbrush just to see you know where it would take me and we had it was a two bedroom house at the time so i used one of the bedrooms as my first studio and then um we had a child and then I, another child somewhere in there we built a studio outside like a garage studio space and i i was out there for about five six years and my husband's a musician and he started uh, developing, um, he started having a band and band practices in my studio space. And at the same time, my career was starting to take off. So we add an addition to the house, a nice, great, big, beautiful addition off the back of the house for my studio. So then we both had our own space to create. And that my process is to paint probably between four to 10 paintings at one time or have them in different stages of development. So the larger space very much um, helped me work towards that. And then uh, two years ago, I, we, we, we decided we, wanted, we were going to um, sell our lake house and move into Gananoque permanently. So the, the gallery on the main street of Gananoque, half, half of the space became my working studio. And uh, that was interesting. It, to, to, to shift your space, I think every 10 years is probably really important. And I, I had that need to do, you get a little stale. So a new space creates a new kind of energy. And being on the main street, there was a lot of people who would walk in, see the work, which I had been craving at the time. I'd been in solitude for my whole career since university um, studio time. So this was something I, I, I was longing for other artists to work with. Uh, Hussam Maloum was painting in the studio with me as a resident visiting artist. My son, when he was home, he would he would be painting too. So I, I, I got what I had been craving for, some more artists around to, uh, to kind of feed off of. And then when the pandemic hit, um, you know, a few months, maybe five months in, we bought another house and this new house, uh, which we're in now, had enough space um, for me to have my studio within the home. Again, it had been a long time since my studio space had been attached to the house. So we closed down the gallery because I didn't need the studio space and no one was coming to town. So it, it just it, it provided an opportunity to make this drastic large shift from shutting the gallery space down, which we had for 10 years or eight years, we had had a gallery space between Kingston and Gananoque. Um, but, I'm, but I'm enjoying being right here in the home. I can't help myself, but I'm painting a lot because it's right here, the access is right here. I don't have to travel anywhere. So at this moment in time, this is working for me. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful to be here in, in this space. It, needs, it, it works well with my medium of choice. I'm a, an acrylic painter, so it's not oil paint, so there's no fumes involved. So that's always been important to me when I had a young family, and then that's just what I've developed. And I, I like 
acrylics because they dry so fast. So this helps my process. I'm very um, uh, automatic painter. I like to create things, um, let ch a lot of chance happen and layer and layer and layer and, and allow the process to lead instead of me in my mind leading the process. Uh, I also um, have I've used spray paint in my work for a long time and spray paint has evolved since for the last 15 years they first uh, brought in acrylic based spray paint so that was wonderful because then I could put them on my canvases and it, they would mix well with the acrylics and I could paint over them and wash over them and they worked well together. And in the last eight years our, uh, the spray paint companies have made every possible color pop you you would want in your palette available through spray paint so this this has changed how i used it i only had a few choices before and now i have every choice in the book and they're they're made to use as an archival uh medium i'm in after my first trip to africa i wanted to incorporate the people i met there so this is when I started using my photographs in my paintings. And how I do that is I print off the image on my home printer. I crop it, print it, move the crop, print it, move the crop, print it, and, and do this depending on the size of the canvas. Like here, these are many pieces of paper printed off. And so paper and ink from the, the, the the home printer um, are part of my process. And just in this last four months, I've started manipulating the paper, um, use, printing off sections of fabric and cutting them into shape, different shapes. So this is, I'm now the paper is becoming part of my medium and my process. After my first trip to Africa in 2008, I created a body of work based on the people I met. I created 40 paintings. It was from my trip to Uganda, and I launched this on Parliament Hill in support of World Malaria Day, the recognition of World Malaria Day. This led me to a new series of work that I was able to do something to tell a story through my art, which I had been longing for. I had been searching and and maybe part of the reason I went to Africa in the first place was to expand my world to tell stories that others don't know about and um, this certainly this became very effective and part of making shifts in, in our family's life so we could do more traveling so I could expand on what I, I've grown to know is my purpose using my art um, and my life's purpose. Heading into our second trip to Africa as a family this time in, in 2011, we were spending a couple of months in Tanzania. Prior to that trip, I read a book called A Thousand Sisters by Lisa Shannon. And it talks about the women in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And it tells their stories, a group of many women and their stories, and their stories are atrocious and they're horrific and graphic and violent and really helpless. And I thought, you know, I need to use my art to do something for these women. And my friend Karen Yates, she's a, um, a doctor and we would be living with her in Tanzania and she had projects there. So she too wanted to go to the Congo. Um, and so we went together and met a man, a doctor at Heal Africa, who then set up an opportunity to meet for us to interview a couple of these women, and we did. And it was uh, very difficult, very difficult to listen, so I can't imagine living through it. Um, I came home from that trip and painted paintings from Tanzania, but these paintings from the Congo 
were difficult for me to paint and I really had a lot of emotion and it was through the paintings that I was able to deal with this emotion. Um, but there was, I was left still with, you know, how do I, where's my responsibility to do something? Now I've witnessed, I've put myself in front of this, I have to do something. Um, Karen and I ended up, she ended up hosting an international nephrology conference at that same hospital where we were 11 months earlier. And I went with her as her traveling companion. And I, I sort of hung out around the, the hospital where the women were um, being operated on to, for their, to repair their fistulas. And um, fistula damage comes from a lot of times from births and, and uh, in unhealthy places and births gone bad or, but a lot of the, unfortunately, a lot of the fistula damage comes from rape and uh, the rebel groups have, have used rape as a weapon of war to control a village of people. You kill the men, you rape the women, and then you control the society. So I, these are the women I had met and, and I had quite a few experiences that were um, life altering, changing, uh, trying to come to terms with how he, other human beings can treat human beings this way. And it's very layered. Um, but I also felt, again, a responsibility. I needed to tell these stories because, you know, the people I knew, people in my world weren't talking about this. And the things that I saw every time I returned from a trip were trivial complaints. And that took time for me to kind of sort through our existence to their existence and find a way for me to be um, live amongst both and I think through my art I've been able to do that I on that last day of that trip meeting all these women I crossed over into the border of Rwanda in this town a border town called Gisenye to the border town of Goma where I was staying and visiting the hospital and I met a man there who at like a, a restaurant, cafe, hotel, where we were both using the internet. And we struck up a conversation and shared who we were and what we were doing and exchanged emails. And he started emailing me um, about the 16 children, orphans he was looking after and telling me about the women and the women's stories and how important it is to tell those women's stories but he said, do you know what happens to the women who don't live? What happens to their kids? And then he, that these are the actual kids he was looking after. So I realized the women's stories are the children's stories. And he, he's kept educating me. He never asked for anything, but he, he told me about the realities of where he was living with the children. Uh, they were living in a shack. And this, they were going to be evicted because they were, the owner of the land and the shack were going to tear it down and, and then they wouldn't have anywhere to live. So on the day that the M23 rebel group invited in, in, invaded the city of Goma where they were staying, I had an overwhelming urge that I had to do something. Like my whole body was just couldn't resist, like couldn't, I couldn't not do something. But my mind was telling me, you only met this man for an hour. How can you trust him? And this isn't rational. But my intuition was telling me, you know, you can't, this can't be how you move forward. So, you know, using my art is what I wanted to do. And I, and I asked the universe to use me just the day before I, I met Kazuzu. So I, I, I listened and I, I put in an email to some friends and family and by the end of the day hmm. by the end of the day I had enough money to build a home for them and a year to the date that I met Kazungu January 10th 2013 they moved into that home but the 16 children had turned to 80 children. And this is where my wall of courage comes in. I began painting all those children. I painted, I thought I would 
you know, paint maybe 20 for an art show. My next art show would be the Children of the Congo. And as I got closer to the date of my art show, I had 15 paintings finished and I laid them out on my studio floor. And I realized that this is one big grid of paintings and I had to paint all 80. So I, I began that journey that day knowing I would, this is much bigger than me. I have no idea where I'm going to show this. I don't know if I'll ever sell them. I don't know how they will be received. And I also started writing the children's stories or their mother's stories on the canvas. And for the first time, I was going to make the viewer very uncomfortable with what they're reading because the realities of the stories are quite graphic. And I'd always use my art to make people feel good. And now I'm going to create an emotion like I had that was unsettling. But at the same time, when I launched those first paintings in my in the gallery space in Kingston, I gave people the opportunity to do something. And that's when I started what became a sponsorship program for those kids and people because they wanted to do something. And once you read it and your heart's open and you actually can do something, I was giving them an opportunity to do something right away. And, and that's how the, the projects just started growing and people would hear the story. And over the years, uh, other people visited Congo with me, like my friend Kathy Cleary, and she began a women's training center because the women came to tell us their stories. A man walked in the gallery, maybe my second or third evolution of the wall growth. And he asked what it was about. I told him, he, I, he said, well, what's next? And I said, well, school fees are very expensive for the kids. So a lot of the money that we raised through the sponsorship goes to school fees. If we could build our own school and pay teachers those school fees, then we could educate hundreds more for free. And he said, I'll build you that school. So he did. So the wall of courage, the, creating the paintings, all the 80, took me three years. And during that time, the projects in the Congo were growing at the same time. And I, in 2016, I finished it. And I first hung it in the barn north of Kingston in Sydenham area. And uh, to see all 80 together was, it's really big. It's 40 feet long and 12 feet high. And every time we hang it, it, it it's an emotional moment for me to, to kind of contemplate and realize how, how um, committed I was to this process and committed I am to those children. And uh, we've done our best to, to tour it. Uh, we brought it to Ottawa, to Florida, to Michigan, um, Kingston, to Isabel Bader, to the Fire Hall Theater. And just most recently, I, it's, it's actually in Los Angeles, in Beverly Hills, which is quite ironic in contrast to where these children are from. from. But that to me is the goal is to, to take those kids, have them be seen as many people as possible. Because once you're seen and heard, you know, you, you matter. And I think a lot of these people who are, have, feel voiceless and all I can offer is a voice for them through the medium that I use. So the Art of Courage has emerged as a nonprofit out of the idea of using your art as a catalyst to create change. All the projects that have grown, the artwork that I use and now continually am growing to expand, to tell stories is the art of courage. And this is how we raise funds to look after the 80 children who have now turned into 140 orphans that, that we, um, the Kazungu, the man in Congo, who I met that day, look after, and also run the Jonathan Holiday School, 
we have other projects and sister projects that I have now friends. Another friend, Vicki Pearson, is building a school on Edgeway Island. It does, just doesn't stop at, at the one thing because the need is continuous. But the quality of life is getting better. And this is where the hope the hope lives. And this is what inspires me. One of the, the original 16 orphans, her name is Lucian. She's now 18, 19 years old. She's taking photos for me. We, we sent money for her to buy a smartphone so she can document what's going on over there because I can't get there with the pandemic. And before that was Ebola. So I haven't been actually to see the projects and the kids and Kazungu for three and a half years. So Lucian now is my eyes. And uh, what's interesting with that is that she's getting a perspective that I never could because she's, these are, you know, where she's from and her, her people. And, and I, I feel so grateful and indebted to this process um, with her. The paintings behind me are, are taken from Lucian's photos. These in particular are of a group of the indigenous people of Idwi Island and the Congo, um, which we call the, the Pygmies. And I've, I've met them a couple of times when I visited the island of Idwi, and I've wanted to tell their story since that first day we met, probably six years ago. So I've now, through Lucian's eye and her capturing images, I'm, use, I'm able to incorporate her imagery uh, and the moment she's captured into my paintings to tell a story about these, this, these people who are so important to the earth that we, and it's completely tragic that we don't honor them as we should. They're living below any sense of dignity or below any kind of poverty level you can imagine. And they, exude something that we're missing, this connection to the earth, this joy, this wonderment, song, laughter, because they haven't lost that connection to the earth, but we, we don't know about them, or if we do, we're not honoring them as we should. So this is what my next series is about, and that's why I'm painting them as saints or you know like a spiritual figure that we should be honoring in a church like we would in a church with stained glass and um, golden halos so i'm lifting them up so we can look to them for the the answers we need po you know what greed what greed and consumption has created the cutting down of their entire livelihood, which would have been the forest where they lived and where they knew how to live, how to cure anything through natural medicines in the forests have been cut down. So now they don't have a way to live the life that they were accustomed to as in this connection with Mother Earth. So it's telling that story in, in contrast to what has created that problem. Well, it's the greed for more wood, it's the greed for minerals, it's greed for oil, it's the greed for more consumption, consumption, consumption. And I think they're, they can tell that story just through their existence and the decline of their existence. And I, but I don't, I want to honor them by, and that's why I'm showing them this way because this is how I feel about them. And I do believe that they have everything to teach us if we would just listen, because we're not getting it right. So this is how my art has evolved. I never know where it's going to take me. Um, a lot of my work recently is about equality for young women or women, and the, and the equality for humans. And I have been painting uh, the, the girls who were on the Wall of Courage originally. Now I'm painting, I painted five of them in their power as, as superheroes. So it shows them as strong, because I believe if, if women had equality, if we, tr if we empowered these young women today with full equality, they would be the superheroes of the future who would save us. It's to me, it's pretty simple. 
you know, what's not working, well, we, then we need to try the exact opposite. And, and women, <laughs> I read something, I think, by Melinda Gates that we're on the track for women to have full equality in 280 years. To me, that, that boggles my mind. My grandchildren won't even, my granddaughters, great-granddaughters, will, will even have equality. This isn't the story I was told, but this is the reality of our world. So we need to recognize that, and we need, how, how can we learn that? Well, I can tell you that story through my art.